Welcome back to Max Reaction. How are you doing today? Hopefully you're having a great, great day. I'm having a good day. Just got off work. I'm going to request, or I'm going to react to a requested video that's been requested many, 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 many times over the last few weeks. And this is the Tubabo Odyssey Refuge in the Philippines. And it has to do with the White Russians. I don't really know too much about the story, so this is going to be a huge learning experience for me. It may be a huge learning experience for you, so we'll learn together. Anyway, let me know where you're from, uh, and let's just get into it. I'm excited to learn some Philippine history, and hopefully you learn a little something along the way with me. Russians was a term used the imperial to designate family. all the Russians who were opposed to the Bolshevik Revolution, spearheaded right. by Lenin. The Bolshevik had adopted the color as red, and so by opposition to the red, white. There also Makes the sense. imperial Russian flag was white and with a double-headed eagle. That was uh, the Tsar's flag. My father was an officer in the Russian White Army wow. during the Tsar of Nicholas II. Revolution came to Russia. He was fighting, but they lost. So he and a part of his army went to the east of Russia and then into the China. You gotta fight for what you believe in, always. The at the time was labeled as a symbol of Western capitalist decadence. And culturally speaking, Mao Zedong was quite keen to sort of eradicate this inheritance from the past. In that course, at the eve of the entry of the Mao Zedong Great Army into Shanghai, these people were not going to be able to live peacefully under this regime. We heard right. how terrible it was for the white Russians. They were taking them to Soviet Russia and some of them, like in the case of one of my uncles, he was shot. Oh. So when we heard that the communists are coming, straight away we got to go leave everything. Wow, so they're trying to fight for what they believe in. It sounds like they're not winning, so they gotta kind of leave. They gotta leave to live because terrible bad things are happening to them. Ugh. And that, that's it, whether you like it or not, you know where you're going. And Mr. Bologov was in charge of the Russian Emigrant Association. Bologov, I understand, was a very flamboyant ex Tsarist officer, and he quickly took upon himself to organize the people. None of us knew where would we wow. end up and what our life would be. What an important like guy in history. Certain. And this is when all these people who were there were regrouped, so to speak, and they, okay, where do we go next? The Philippines? President. Updo Corano Foundation. Corano. Memory Project. These people have no consular representation. They had no one to turn to. And as we've seen, various communities among them, not only Russians, so it was not a monolithic block. They were all Russian speaking, they were culturally Russian, but my goodness, we had Ukrainians, right. we had Estonians, we had Jews, we had Gypsies. Tartar from Crimea. Many nations. Ibians. There were also some of Armenians and Georgians. Czech, Poles, wow. Hungarians. We even had one family of Hindus. Nonetheless, the IRO was approached by the leader of the so-called White Russian, Colonel Borogov, saying, save us. Wow, that's powerful. So, the IRO launched an appeal, and the countries were busy with their own reconstruction. None of them replied to the call of IRO. Well, in this very, very remote corner 
of Asia, the only country who replied to the call of Iroh was the Philippines. Wow. <laughs> Barely independent, but also reconstructing the country which has suffered terrible devastation. Nonetheless, President Quirino put an act on the table <laughs> and said, we Philippines will accept these people. And that is so powerful and it speaks so many volumes of how loving the people in the Philippines are um, from powerful people like the president at the time on down wel welcoming these people that no other country said yes we'll accept you but the Philippines like he said still recovering from uh, terrible terrible events a young young uh, country as far as you know the independent side they're like yes we'll take we'll take we'll take you guys we'll take you we love you we love people we want to help that's awesome that's just awesome <laughs> i don't know how else to say it awesome to appreciate the political significance of such an act by the Philippines and the leadership of President Quirino yes. to grant asylum to a group of people in need of international protection. That is remarkable. Yes. Oh, oh. <laughs> I mean, you should feel lots of pride. Awesome. That makes me happy. Just hearing it, seeing it, learning about it. On the 26th of February in 49 and I don't know how many days it took on board the ship probably about six days or so six days of ship Tatay Kwan Mangudan newspaper Makanikunot Mga Rusya na Tobabaw Pagagusin Mga Oscar Simbana Kinikita Mangudamon ang barko na kada di damay manikani this is so heartwarming and exciting. Nagakot at Taira, di ka ng barko nga David sa Kamparang, ang barge ni Jose Ulanda. up on a PAL flight and luckily enough I got a seat by the window. Oh my lord, they had the blue ocean, oh, yeah. they had the little islands, they had the palm trees sticking yeah. up. I mean it was great. And the scenery to see those islands. I can't imagine, you know, they're up in Russia by in China. Um, having all these problems, fighting for what they believe in, they're losing their cause, some of them are dying. And the Philippines say, yes, come on, we'll take you. And then when they land and they take off in the plane and they're looking out the window, it's like paradise, you know? It's like this bright light that they're looking at. It's like, wow, like he's saying, these blue waters, these palm trees, the beauty of the Philippines, and we all know how beautiful the Philippines is. Um, it just... It must be a glorious sight. And then, not only just the scenery, you know, and the visuals, but... The welcome, welcome, welcoming arms, you know, of the people. That just adds to it. Um, what an amazing story so far. Some waters look purple. Some waters look pink because the sun was coming up. And reflection. And it was such a gorgeous, extremely gorgeous sight. They're getting me excited. I want, I want to be there now. <laughs> now. <laughs> In a 
very pragmatic Filipino spirit. The decision makers at the time said, oh, again, we've got the old hospital structure on the island of Tubabao, which was built by the Americans for the landing operations. Well, instead of having the structure go to waste, we might as well recycle it into a refugee camp. Right. But unfortunately, when the white Russians arrived in Giwan, and particularly in Tubabao Island, nothing was left ah. except for some pavements. Noon, magami ng damo, dire mga pa postura. Think positive and build, build, build. It's an awesome, you know, chance. Of course, it was more difficult, you know, because of the living conditions of living in a tent. On it. They gave us all those army cots, you know, to sleep on, quite a shock. Right. After living so many years in the cities, you know, you have to come and live in tents, you know, in the middle of nowhere. It was a shock because we didn't know what to expect, especially these people that arrived two weeks before. In two weeks, you see somebody in shorts and some of them even no shoes at all. What's happening? But, you know, new culture, new experience. Say, We're waiting for a refugee camp for us. So they build it themselves. Clearing up the bushes, the jungles, leveling the ground, uh, and so on, with supports from Filipino communities around them, support from the Philippine government. Yes. Lots of support. When we got the, to the tent, the grass was up to your knees, so you had to pull out all this so that you could put the cot into the place and put your belongings in. My father and I went into the jungle. And I mean, it kind of sounds like they're griping, they're kind of complaining, but they're, I, I don't really think that's what they're meaning by this. I think they're just trying to explain a whole new experience that they've never experienced before. Uh, it's eye-opening, you know, it's, it's different culture, you know, different way of life. So I don't really think they're complaining, I just think they're explaining, man, this is so different. This is what we had to do. This is what we went through. Uh, it should make you appreciate your life so so good, you know? And um, there's nothing to complain about because this is an opportunity. This is a chance that was given to them that no other country did. So uh, that's just my thoughts there. Cut some um, reeds and we build a fence around our tent. Privacy. When you need to do things, you, you find a way. That's right. You know, there are a lot worse things in this world, you know. Soon we got used to it. We right. were happy. Right. We were safe. When you think about and it. And that's the key words. They were happy once they got used to it. They were safe. Plus they're in paradise. So, what else do you want, you know? But they lived in Russia and then they moved to China and they had already lived there for 25 years or more. And then they had to be uprooted again. And here they were living on an island where they didn't know, is this going to be the rest of our life or what's going to be the next step? I think irrespective of that, they were happy, positive looking right. forward people. As my father always You're said, alive. as long as you have life. Yes. Yes, she said it right out of my mouth. Live, you're alive. You have to get accustomed to a different kind of life. And for the elderly people, it was difficult. For us youngsters, we took it as a holiday. All of a sudden, we could see all our friends living together. At that age, you know, everything is wonderful. Right. I love it. All the positivity that's coming out of this video. I love the scenery. I love the sunsets. Every day it was different and You'll very fall in love glorious with and beautiful. Our tents were right in the jungle. And you could smell the beautiful flowers at night. Yes. So strong. It was just exquisite. <laughs> I would say it was very well organized because everybody had a job over there. Most of the stuff was taken care of by our own people. Engineers right. who rigged up provided lighting for the entire camp. Right. My father became a policeman and all the teenagers like my age 15, we had assignment to take care of small children. My uncle, 
he was advanced uh, engineering group that came to Tumbaval in January, and they built a dam for our water supply. Wow! My dad was assigned to go on the water truck. There were about three or four guys. They would go wherever it was that they got the water, and then they bring it back and they deliver it to the kitchen, you know, that kind of thing. So we couldn't really waste a lot of water. Almost all the ladies who were capable worked in the kitchen, which was up on the hill, so you would see these ladies going up. So they had actual shifts when they had to work. But every 10 days or every two weeks, the group had to go out there and prepare meals for the district, you know, we had about 14 districts, that would be the third. We right. set up our own little city of 4,000 people. We, we had a hospital with nurses and doctors. And, no, and you're hearing all these wonderful stories of how they're making a community, how they're making a town, and without the Philippines saying, yes, come live on our land, on our soil, the soil that we fought over uh, so many wars over time, the soil that we've bled for, we're willing to share our soil with you because we care. That's, that's such an, a, that's, a, so, that's so powerful. That's what I'm getting out of this. It's just so powerful. Everybody, every Filipino, everybody in the world needs to know this story. And I did, I'm, I'm sad to say I did not know the story until you guys recommended me this video and I'm reacting to it now, watching it for the very first time. And I want to thank you, but let's keep going on with the video. The church was constructed out near the oval, far out from camp, which was the main support or cathedral. There were other churches there as well. One was in a tent, I recall, was a Baptist. There were several denominations, but the main one was the Russian Orthodox. They would go to church every Sunday. Some people would go to church every day. The people were very religious, yes. And then they opened up a school there. <laughs> so all the children went there, and the, all the best teachers, you know, taught us. There was an Iro school, and there was a Russian school. This is awesome. There was an orphanage that came with the Russians. John is coming, so they start ringing the bell, because that's a tradition, you know, the bishop comes in, you know, the bells ring. Oh, St. John, no matter when you come to the cathedral in Shanghai, he was always there. St. John of Shanghai would uh, gather people off the streets, no matter what background they had, they took him in. He managed to take care of all these kids, boys and girls. I was one of the younger group that was uh, in the orphanage. We had a big tent. Half of it was boys, half of it was girls. President Elpidio Quirino came oh. to the camp. And, yes. Uh, you know, the band met him with the nice music. It was President Quirino and according to them, his daughter. I remember that we had an artist over there that made a, like a thank you wow. memorial with all the signatures of different <laughs> group people as a thank you for him. I love that in this video they've told their experience but they're they're telling how much they appreciate what the Filipino uh, president and the Philippine people in the country, the Philippines, did for them. You can just tell it in their voice, you can tell it in their eyes, you can tell it through their stories that they're so grateful, so thankful for, for the opportunity to have a life because before then they didn't know where their life was going. They may not have a life, their life may end and here they've established something special on special soil, like I said, that so many people have bled over to keep it the Philippines and that's just, it's so powerful and so amazing. In the camp, they had curfew. They were not free to go in and out of that camp all the time. And the president decided to take down the fences, you know. And that was a meaning that you're not in the camp. And they can trust you, that, that's a sign of trust. Take the fences down, we trust you. Live your life. The act that President Kirin opposed through an agreement with the International Refugee Organization said, look, we can accept them. In exchange, IRO, please help us to find the durable solution to the plight of these refugees, which was done through advocacy right. and work done by IRO with Canada, Australia, United States, France, Belgium, Germany, Argentina, Paraguay, Santo wow. Domingo, and a few other countries. Now, 
The first difficulty was the fact that the major resettlement instrument which existed within the arsenal of law in the United States, the Displaced Person Act, was outdated. For instance, prohibited persons who came from countries who were deemed as unfriendly to the United States ah. to be resettled. So, what Russians were technically from a nationality point of view were coming from Russia. So therefore, at the beginning, they were not eligible for oh. the settlement. Oh, that's so terrible. Come on, United States, get your things, get your, get to, get it together. Why? Why does the United States have to make so many things so difficult? I'm disappointed. Uh, I'm proud of a lot of the United States history, but I'm disappointed in a lot of United States history too. There's a mixed bag of uh, disappointment and proud in there, trust me. Um, there's a lot of things that I'm very disappointed in, and this would be one of them, among other things. They didn't want to accept us because we were not under the GP bill. They tried many other countries. Nobody wants a bunch of 6,000 Russians. So it's not just the United States, it's basically all the countries but the Philippines, as far as I can tell right now. And, uh, wow. And St. John, he actually left the Babao, went to America, and he prayed on the steps of Congress. And literally sat on the steps till they would hear him. Right. Be loud. Be demanding. Be proud. Until somebody noticed him from the American Congress and said, what are you doing here? And that's when he appealed to the American Congress to allow the white Russians to migrate to America. Senator Nolan arrived Thank at you. the camp in November of 1949. And he gave promises that people can actually enter the United States of America through the Displaced Persons Bill. Generally, they were very happy that Senator Nolan was there and that he was actually looking into taking them in. Yes. So it was somehow a vision of hope for them. Absolutely. I hope it, I hope it happened. I don't know. I hope it did, though. <laughs> I need to know. I need to know. These paintings are pretty powerful in themselves. If you really, really think about it, I about fell out of the chair. <laughs> there were quite a few artists there and they used to regularly go and paint. My uncle painted over 200 paintings. Wow, so these are real life shots. Amazing. Because my father was a doctor, he was allowed to visit the white Russian camp in Tubabao. And through Bravo. his work with the white Russians, he invited some people that he knew in the camp over to our house. They used to come to the house once or twice a month on a weekend. Awesome. Since a lot of the people in the camp had some kind of ability to do some crafts, I remember that some women used to sell flowers to some people in Giwan. As one of the ways of the earning some money, they did this. Pag nagkakasalubong kami, galing ako sa eskwela, <laughs> sasabihin sa akin, Dabi rin, Jane, sasabihin ko yan, Give me bread, I will give you flower. Yes, yes, yes. Awesome. Katima, kumukuha ko na ang bulaklak na ang tawag dito, laglag. O yan ang binibigay ko. Binibigyan ako ng malalaking American bread. Pag uh, ano ko, uuwi ko, mayroon dara akong American bread. Wow. I like the intermingling. I was a member of the parish choir. Mr. Donayu, who was the finance officer of the Aero, he got interested. So we were invited to have our rehearsals in Tubabao, where the White Russians were staying. Mr. Stenberg, a White Russian, was our organ player. He was a great pianist. There were about 50 people who were musicians. I know that there was one piano teacher who had students in Guiyuan.
nasa katlong bait ako na bumabang paaralan nang mag-aral ako ng piano sa kay Professor Walter, isang Russian refugee. Bawat leksyon, isang oras, limang piso ang bayan. Five peso for an hour. Everybody put in this, this salary into a special fund and uh, in our district they all agree to use it to make the food a little more palatable. Kasi hindi naman mga sanay kumain ng isda siguro yung mga rawso. Kaya may rasyon sila every other day ng baka ng mga negosyante dito. Isa na yung ama ko na nagahatid sa tubabaw ng baka. Dahil sa siya ang nagrarasyon ng baka sa mga Russian refugee nakilala niya si Professor Walter na marunong magtugtog Kaya pinapag-aral kami. Wow! That's an awesome story about her father delivering Madam me. Madam Karamsin was the third piano teacher that I had in Giwan who taught me a lot. She was the one who uh, taught me more about piano than anybody else. So they're sharing each other's cultures and the way they live life and learning from each other. So there's just so many positives out of this story. Like so much. I learned from them that they were from past nobility and so on and so forth. Her husband was a great artist. He did uh, painting and metal crafting. Very talented people. They always came whenever we had parties in the house, we had picnics. In fact, uh, they were almost part of the family for us. And when I had my 12th birthday, she decided oh. to give oh. me as a gift, wrapped up in a little handkerchief because she couldn't afford anything else to oh. wrap it up in, was a ring, pearl ring that she had owned since she was a young lady from wow. Russia, in which I kept for many years. And this was the type of relationship that we had with this white Russian. That is so heartwarming, isn't it? I love the happiness of the story. During our graduation, Mr. Stenberg also accompanied our graduation song. We also invited some female white Russians who had oral rendition to the great applause of the audience. performances and enjoy that and the lectures. We kept our culture, our own, all everything Russian. We had ballets, we had orchestras. There was a musical group uh, that had operettas because there was a group of actors. I enjoyed the stage very much, so I was always on stage, either dancing or acting or something. We right. movies twice a week, almost every week. We had our own dance band and dances and all that. We could go and swim in the ocean every day, and they actually set up some facilities out there where you could swim. It was like a wooden raft. You could just sit out there in the middle and uh, jump in the water. What an amazing life for these Fresh people now. delivered. Nice bread from Guan, and then uh, people would line up with the army mess kits. And if we didn't eat it, it would spoil, so we would trade it. One time I got two loaves of bread, and I went down to the village, and I talked to some guy, he had a canoe, and I said, hey, can I use it for a while, you know, I'll give you bread. That's when I discovered fishing for the sea. <laughs> that was great. This was how the life went on. So much you have love. within the community all the acts which characterize a human society. There yes. were some poets, there were some intellectuals, there were some manual laborers. They were all kind of walk of life. Some of them were falling sick, some were falling in love. <laughs> How could you not fall in love with the country, the people? How could you not? A very big typhoon. Ooh. Oh no. Typhoon Gloria. First everybody was 
scared because most of the people have never been in a typhoon. Right. Very destructive typhoon. You know, the Russians were only leaving once it out in some tents. Right. I remember holding down the tents. Shaking the tent and it was all very noisy and everything. I remember watching the men digging a hole so we could hide. Wow. John prayed and prayed and prayed. Bishop will go around and uh, he will cross all the sides. Apparently, his prayers were successful in turning the typhoon. <laughs> Typhoon There's just that the typhoon that they had. The name of the typhoon was Typhoon Army. After the orphanage left, two of them were destroyed by the typhoon. Everything is broken. Oh, no. Pipes, water pipes. That bad typhoon. It was a parrot. Camping and absolutely destroyed the whole camp completely. You can get through it. You got through a lot. They can get through this, right? It destroyed the bridge constructed by the Americans, connecting Giwan and Tubabaw Island, and also their tents. Some of them got sick after the typhoon, oh. and they said uh, it was really a difficult life. Right. And they had to survive. They had to be relocated. So at first they were sent to Tacloban City. Tacloban. They were sent back to Gigo. So they had to rebuild again. And that's how resilient they are. Very resilient. The best part of that, that were the memories of togetherness it was a very important feeling to be having this togetherness that oh, we yeah. are unit you, you know, gotta be one got to fight it enjoy the life meanwhile yes such powerful pictures Some of them migrated to South America, including Argentina, Paraguay. Santo Domingo, but also Germany, Belgium. France had the particularity towards the end to say all the woman-headed households with patients who were suffering from tuberculosis would be accepted by France. And the able-bodied men went to Sydney and then by 1950, the amendments to the bill was finally passed. So by 1951, Nolan's promise finally materialized. Finally. Finally, the people were able to live their new life in the United States of America. SS Marine Jumper leaving Habibo. And indeed on the ship that we came on here, the Marine Jumper, we disembarked in Sydney whilst others continued on to Uruguay and so on, South America. We're glad we were leaving and finally going someplace where we're going to settle down. But then the other hand, we didn't know when are we going to meet again. You know, right. Of course, I missed a lot of friends. I'd want to stay in the Philippines. <laughs> Even if they were young at that time, they understood what it meant for someone like President Kino to save their lives. Yes. So they tell it to their children and their children's children. And even to this day, they're very, very grateful. He was a savior for them, a hero for them. Thank the you, Corena. The community and to Lata owes tremendous thanks to President Corina. Well, I'd like thank to you, thank Corina. him for letting us spend time in the Philippines. Thank you for them to give us place to stay. <laughs> 
I'm grateful for the experience. I'm grateful to the Philippine people. And there's lots of good things and lots of bad things, but we persevered. It was better than any pirate movie I've ever seen before, you know? <laughs> when you're young, you don't think of the rest of your life. You just live everything. Right. It's such a good life. But as you grow older, and you begin yes. to reminisce yes. about your life, and that team that really did come, oh. it changed everybody's life. That's my feeling toward the Philippines. Forever grateful. Forever grateful. Oh my gosh, she's gonna make me cry. <laughs> oh. Happy, happy, happy tears. Oh my goodness. Why did I wait so long to react to this? Because it was requested a few weeks ago and I keep seeing people randomly request it. Um, what an amazing story, a story that I'll never forget. A story, um, even though I'm not Filipino or from the Philippines, that I can be proud of, you know. Um, what an amazing, amazing, amazing thing Carino did at the time of accepting these people in, giving them a chance to live like, like they said, he's kind of like a savior type uh, person because he's he basically helped save their life because they got to come you know to the Philippines and experience the Philippines, build a community, live, be themselves, learn new cultures, learn a new. Uh, a new people that is going to show their love to them and they can return the favor and the trials and tribulations that they had to go through made them stronger and stronger and stronger and uh, to share that soil the soil that has been fought over so many times throughout history and uh, and for them to be able to live their lives that's just an awesome heartwarming story and so much has been uh, learned through this story um, it just shows you the love the kindness and uh, just everything the Philippines brings. So I want to, I want you, to, I want to thank you for sharing this story to me because I did not know uh, the link to this story will be down below. Go check it out. If you have any comments you want to comment to me, definitely comment. If you haven't subscribed, what are you waiting for? Hit that subscribe button. Join the family. But for now, I'll see you next time. Peace.